Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm Lucinda Brown, and I head up the Will and Trust Disputes team for BDB Pitmans. It's great to see so many of our friends and contacts today attending from all corners of the UK and also from the Channel Islands for our knowledge sharing session on Privy Council Appeals. Privy Council Appeals are a fairly specialist topic. As a firm, we do a lot of work in this area, and today you'll be hearing from our Privy Council Appeals team, who will explain how these appeals work in practice and the types of issues that typically come across our desks. The cases often have a trust angle, and so this work complements the work we do in our Will and Trust Dis Disputes team very well. We're delighted to be joined today by our guest speaker, Tom Poole of Three Hair Court, who's going to be speaking alongside Lavinia Randall, an associate in our Will and Trust Disputes team and Privy Council Appeals team. Tom was called to the bar in 2001 and has a broad practice across the full range of commercial disputes with particular expertise in offshore matters. Tom undertakes a large amount of work in the Privy Council and has extensive experience of appellate advocacy at all levels. Tom can also claim the prize for acting in the UK's longest fully remote trial. I'll leave it to Tom to tell us how long it was, but you might like to hazard a guess in the meantime. The answer will be revealed at the end of the session. There will be an opportunity for questions and answers at the end of the talks. And so if you have a question, please do direct it to the question and answer box. The webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on YouTube after the event. I'll now hand over to Lavinia and Tom. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, we'll be speaking this afternoon about the Privy Council, or to give it its full name, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. Tom will start by giving us an overview of the Privy Council, explaining what it does, who the judges are, and perhaps most interestingly, how the judges make their decisions about an appeal. I'm then going to give an overview of the procedure in appeals to the Privy Council, drawing attention to aspects which are not necessarily obvious just from reading the rules, and the current arrangements for video hearings. I will also touch upon costs and interim relief. Tom is then going to talk briefly about some recent Privy Council cases that we've been involved in involving trust issues. Hopefully we'll have time for some questions um, that have been posted in the Q&A box as we've been speaking and we'll be joined by some of my colleagues from the Privy Council team, including Richard Langley, head of the team, to discuss your questions. Uh, as Lucinda mentioned, BDB Pitmans have many years experience acting as agents on appeals from a variety of jurisdictions, both repellents and respondents. And the appeals we've worked on span a wide range of practice areas, including commercial and property issues, but many will involve will and trust disputes. I'm going to hand over now to Tom to talk a little bit more about the role and functions of the Privy Council. Thanks, Lavinia, and afternoon, everyone. We can uh, move on to our first slide, please. Uh, a bit like the reduced Shakespeare company, I'm going to attempt to compress about 950 years of history into about 10 minutes. And also, as Lavinia said, try to do my best to explain what the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council does, who the judges are, and how the judges make their decisions. Now, the starting point is understanding the difference between the Privy Council and the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. Now, the Privy Council advises the Queen in carrying out her duties as monarch. And as the historians out there will know, it was once an extremely powerful institution. However, most of its power now lies in the hands of one of its committees, not sadly the Judicial Committee, but the Cabinet. And there are currently about 500 members of the Privy Council, including all current and former members of the Cabinet, the Speaker of the House of Commons, the leaders of all major political parties, some archbishops, various senior judges, and other public uh, figures. Once appointed, an individual is a Privy Councillor for life. However, the Queen does have the power to remove individuals and notoriously the last person to be removed was Elliot Morley in 2011, who was expelled from the Privy Council following a conviction on charges of false accounting in connection with the MP's expenses scandal. Now the Privy Council has various committees, as I've touched on, the Cabinet being one, and we know the Judicial Committee being another. Now, the origins of the Judicial Committee date back to the court of the Norman Kings, which used to meet in private, hence the description privy. In those days, it was called the Curia Regis, meaning Royal Council or King's Court, and sprung from that was the British judicial system. So subjects who had grievances against the administration of justice could submit their petitions to the King, who exercised supreme appellate jurisdiction. When Parliament developed out of this council, the majority of petitions were referred to the High Court of Parliament, which became the chief appellate tribunal. 
At the beginning of the 14th century, receivers were appointed to aid the dispensation of justice in Parliament. One group was appointed for Great Britain and Ireland, and one group for the Channel Islands. And interestingly, appeals from the Channel Islands became the first regular appellate business of the King's Council, now the Judicial Committee. With the growth of the British Empire, the number of appeals and petitions increased and the Privy Council Committees were formed. One of the problems, though, with those appeals committees were that members of an appeals committee had equal votes, and there was absolutely no requirement that any of the Privy Councillors actually hearing a particular appeal had to be a lawyer. Now, some may say that's a good thing, but uh, what was found is that it was possible for parties to appeal to secure desired judgment by persuading non-lawyer Privy Councillors to attend hearings on their appeals. And for that reason, the appeals committees fell into disrepute. In 1833, at the instigation of the then Lord Chancellor, Parliament passed the Judicial Committee Act. And that is the act that established what we know today as the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council to hear appeals then to the King in Council. In addition to appeals from the British Empire, later legislation gave the Judicial Committee appellate jurisdiction over a range of miscellaneous matters, such as patents, ecclesiastical matters and prize suits. In addition, the Judicial Committee was given jurisdiction to hear appeals of decisions taken by the Court of Admiralty of the Sank Ports, a court which covers disputes arising from seafaring between the south coast of England and a point just off the French coast. Now, you can be forgiven for being unfamiliar with the Court of Admiralty of the Sank Ports as it last sat in 1914. In the 1920s, it was said that people living on a quarter of the planet could bring their appeals to the Judicial Committee. So at that stage, that was Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, and even parts of Africa. Today, the Judicial Committee holds jurisdiction and appeals from 32 different jurisdictions. And those can be broken down into 13 Commonwealth countries, three Crown dependencies, so Jersey, Guernsey, and the Isle of Man, 14 UK overseas territories, and perhaps surprisingly, Brunei. It's fair to say that although the geographical size of the Judicial Committee's jurisdiction has contracted, its role in certain respects has expanded. It's no longer, for example, confined to the Crown, since the Judicial Committee serves as the final Court of Appeal of three republics. Now, a prize to anyone who can name all three. The Judicial Committee now has the status of a constitutional court across a very wide range of overseas jurisdictions. It is a guarantor of legal security and certainty in offshore centres serving interests worldwide. As a result, the volume of appeals which the Judicial Committee handles has scarcely diminished over the years. On average, the Judicial Committee delivers around 45 judgments a year, which is quite a lot for a constitutional court. As we see on the next slide, that is broken down by jurisdiction. In no particular order, Trinidad and Tobago, the Bahamas, Jamaica and Mauritius send the largest number of appeals to the Judicial Committee. That's largely because there's an automatic right of appeal from their courts of appeal to the Privy Council, whereas in most other jurisdictions, the Court of Appeal can refuse permission to appeal to the Privy Council. So if we go back to the previous slide, we can see that there are typically around three appeals a year from Jersey and Guernsey. Now, as you can imagine, given the numerous different jurisdictions, the Judicial Committee is called on to resolve a whole range of legal issues in both criminal and civil appeals. So for example, I've appeared in the Judicial Committee arguing about common intention constructive trusts in the Bahamas, a little bit more about that later when we talk about the case of Ma and Collie, but also environmental impact assessments concerning natural gas in Bermuda and a defamation case arising out of a political rally in Trinidad. The Judicial Committee has also delivered judgment in a number of significant tr trust cases in recent years. For example, Webb and Webb, a case that was heard earlier this year on appeal from the Cook Islands, in which it was held that the trust was illusory because the settlers' rights were indistinguishable from ownership. You've also had numerous appeals from Guernsey in relation to the Chengez Trusts, and as I said, Mar and Colley. Now I want to say something about the composition of panels and boards. Generally, three members of the Judicial Committee sit as a panel to consider applications for permission to appeal. For Judicial Committee hearings, it's usual for five members to sit as a board. But for matters of particular legal, public or constitutional importance, a panel of seven or even nine members may sit. The Privy Councillors comprising the panels and boards are commonly Justices of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. But from time to time, Privy Councillors with the appropriate qualification so present or former high judicial office 
also sit on boards. Occasionally, also overseas judges sit from time to time. For example, I appeared in an appeal before the Judicial Committee about the constitutionality of the mandatory death penalty, where there were eight Supreme Court justices, or law lords as they then were, plus the Chief Justice of the Jamaican Supreme Court, Edward Zacker, who was one of the majority, which by five to four upheld the mandatory death penalty. That was the case of Matthew in the state of Trinidad and Tobago. Since 2009, the Judicial Committee has sat in its own courtroom, Court 3 in the Supreme Court and Judicial Committee building, which is located opposite the Houses of Parliament in Parliament Square, where it also shares its registry with the Supreme Court. Before 2009, the Judicial Committee sat in the Privy Council Chamber, which was actually within number 13 Downing Street. Over the last decade, the Judicial Committee has, on invitation from local jurisdictions, sat on various occasions to hear appeals overseas. So, for example, the Judicial Committee has sat in the Bahamas on a number of occasions and also Mauritius. Sadly, the Judicial Committee is yet to make it out to Jersey and Guernsey. I finally want to say something about how judges make their decisions about appeals. Now, I confess to having something of an inside track here, as a number of junior members of my chambers have acted as judicial assistants in the Judicial Committee. Now, what that means is that you're assigned to a Supreme Court justice and will sit with that judge when they're hearing appeals and assist him or her with any legal research required to write a judgment. It also means that you sit in on judicial deliberations. The process, I'm told, is that as soon as a hearing is complete, the judges who have heard the appeal go into a meeting room to discuss it with one another. Each judge gives the others his or her initial opinion and the reasons for it. The most junior judge always goes first. The theory, I think, being that he or she will not be influenced by the more senior judges. Now, the judges don't have to agree, but they do have to reach a majority decision. One judge will be chosen to write the lead judgment, outlining the decision of the majority, and then the other judges may also write a judgment if they wish. Those judges who disagree with the majority can also write a dissenting judgment. Once the judgment is finalised, a date is set for it to be handed down in court, and most judgments of the Judicial Committee technically take the form of advice to the Queen, as the court's orders are confirmed by the Privy Council before they are formally given effect. That's why when you read a judgment of the Judicial Committee, it will often end with the words, the board will humbly admire, advise Her Majesty. Now, before I hand back to Lavinia, I did say a prize to anyone who can name the three republics that appeal to the Judicial Committee. So in alphabetical order, they are Kiribati, Mauritius, and Trinidad and Tobago. I'll hand back to Lavinia now, who's going to tell us all about Privy Council procedure. Thank you, Tom. I will be talking about procedure, but I promise it will only be an overview. I respect we might have some of you logging off. Uh, so the starting point is, of course, permission to appeal. It's a matter for local lawyers to seek permission from their Court of Appeal, but if the Court of Appeal does not grant permission, the appellant can make an application for permission directly from the Privy Council, and this is known as special leave to appeal. The procedure for this is, as you would expect, the appellant sets out full details of the case and their grounds of appeal, including their submissions as to how they meet the test for obtaining special leave. The test for special leave is whether the, the appeal raises an arguable point of law of general public importance, which ought to be considered by the Privy Council at this time. All three limbs of the test must be passed, and obviously the third limb gives the board a huge discretion to pick and choose which cases they want to hear. We have had recent experience of an application that certainly appeared to have met the first two limbs, but presumably then founded on the third. The respondent is entitled to make submissions objecting to special leave. The application is then considered by a panel of three judges, and in our experience, they typically reach a decision within around four months. If special leave is granted, the appellant refiles their notice of appeal and states their intention to proceed. The appellant's notice for a Privy Council appeal might be quite different to an appeal notice in the courts below. In addition to the grounds of appeal, the appellant appeal notice is expected to, con to contain a fairly full narrative history of the dispute and the proceedings in the court below, including an analysis of the issues and the way in which those courts dealt with those issues. The respondents then file a respondent's notice if they wish to participate in the appeal. However, it doesn't contain any substantive content. It's essentially just a, an acknowledgement of service. There's no obligation on them to spell out the grounds on which they resist the appeal until they file their written case, which comes much later. 
And that's even the case if the respondent intends to ask the board to uphold the Court of Appeal's decision on different grounds to those relied on by the Court of Appeal. From this point on, the procedure is quite distinctive to the Privy Council. The first step is for the parties to agree the contents of a bundle known as the reproduced record, which is not to be confused with the certified record, which is a bundle of documents that were before the Court of Appeal, and the Registrar of the Court of Appeal will then transmit that to the Registrar of the Privy Council. And that's often a condition that's imposed by the Court of Appeal when granting permission to appeal. It may come as a surprise to any local lawyers out there that once the certified appeal, certified record arrives at the Privy Council registry, it is just put on a shelf um, in the basement and I'm afraid it's never looked at again. Um, so sorry to anybody who spent hours compiling those records and trying to persuade a very busy local registrar to certify the contents so that the appeal can proceed. The idea of the reproduced record is that the parties cooperate to reproduce from the certified record only those documents which are necessary for the appeal and also actually you can include any other documents which weren't in the certified record and they have to be reorganized into the structure that the board of the privy council is familiar with and will expect the next stage and another aspect in which appeals to the privy council will likely differ from other appellate jurisdictions is for the parties to agree the contents of a document known as the statement of facts and issues a chronology which covers both the facts of the case and the procedural history and a one-page precy of the case great care should be taken over the statement of facts and issues because this may well be the first document that members of the board read in order to get to grips with the appeal a month before the hearing, the appellant will file their written case, which is much more than a skeleton argument and sort of somewhere between a skeleton argument and written submissions. And the respondent will file their own two weeks later. Until recently, all of these documents would have been filed both in hard copy and electronically. But since the pandemic, the registry has been closed and documents are currently only filed electronically. This means you have quite a substantial uh, electronic bundle. We're working on one at the moment that's over 9,000 pages. Um, and if, if that were in hard copy, that would be pretty monumental and quite cumbersome. Um, but the electronic bundle is a single PDF. It's fully bookmarked, OCR searchable, so it makes it much more manageable. And the board are pretty used to dealing with this. You'd be surprised how tech savvy some of these uh, justices are. The rules on the bundles are very prescriptive and not the same as in other types of civil litigation in England, but we are well used to navigating them. So moving on to the main event and the next slide. Uh, the hearing will typically be for five justices and the composition of the panel for each hearing is announced at the start of the court term, so you know in advance who you're going to get. As Tom mentioned, on occasion, if an appeal is considered significant because it raises important or novel points of law, the board will be expanded to seven justices or even nine, much like the Supreme Court do for significant decisions. Uh, for example, many of you will be aware of the so-called black swan jurisdiction in the BVI, which was recently considered by the Eastern Caribbean Court of Appeal and is has been appealed again to the Privy Council. We are instructed by one of the respondents and the appeal has been expedited to a hearing before a board of seven justices in February because it's considered to be a significant case. Uh, before the pandemic, hearings were typically conducted in person and they are broadcast live on the Privy Council website for anyone who's interested in watching. It has been possible for several years for one or both parties council to appear before the board by video link and the, the board will sit in, in the courtroom and watch them on the screen. Uh, we've seen that done, but in our experience, advocates who do that tend to be at a disadvantage. However, of course, at the moment, there are no in-person hearings because of the pandemic. Everything is taking place by video. This means that you get to see the justices in their own homes, in their home offices. Uh, you might even see Lord Kitchen in his kitchen. Um, but I personally have found their home offices to be slightly less exciting or fancy than I hoped they might be. Like all courts, Privy Council has had to adjust to the dreaded new normal, but um, say for a few snags, it seems to be going pretty well. Um, I think everybody is hoping to return to in-person hearings because it's not quite the same by video, but everyone is at least on a level playing field. After the hearing, there is the usual wait for judgment, and in terms of time scale, it can vary widely. I've sometimes waited six months for judgment, and on other occasions, it's been as little as three weeks. Uh, our typical estimate is that overall it will take around 12 to 18 months from filing the notice of appeal to the hearing with another three to six months to obtain judgment. So typically 15 to 24 months from start to finish. 
There is, of course, then the issue of costs, which I deal with on the next slide. The general rule is the same as for most civil litigation in England, which is that the unsuccessful party pays the winning party's costs, although there might be a more nuanced order if one party has succeeded on some points but not on others. Uh, if you need to take enforcement action, it may be possible to register the, the order of the Privy Council in the local jurisdiction so that you can enforce against assets there. One final point I want to make about procedure um, is something that we've encountered recently. Uh, where the board has shown itself to be quite flexible and willing to react to the particular circumstances of a case. The registrar herself is very experienced, approachable and pragmatic and we saw that we've seen that in the Black Swan case that I mentioned earlier. In that case the Court of Appeal had set aside a freezing injunction granted at first instance. The appellant applied to the board for a stay of the Court of Appeal's order, so i.e to restore the freezing injunction which had been granted by the High Court in reliance on the Black Swan jurisdiction. The, an appeal panel granted the application for a stay, even though the appellants had not actually got final leave to appeal to the Privy Council yet, and so they hadn't even filed a notice of appeal. It was quite surprising to us. Um, and this all took place in the middle of the summer vacation. So as I say, that's, that's an example of the board being quite flexible. Generally, though, interim relief is not um, it's far from routine and it certainly isn't automatic. So the general position is that an, an order being appealed takes effect despite appeal to the Privy Council. Interim relief for gem should generally be sought from the Court of Appeal first, but if it's not granted, an application can still be made to the Privy Council, as we've just seen in the Black Swan case. I will hand back over to Tom now, who's going to talk about some case studies involving uh, trust issues. Thanks, Lavinia. Uh, we can go on to our next slide. As it says there, I'm going to talk about a couple of recent Privy Council decisions dealing with trusts. First is the case of Marr and Colley, which was heard in the Privy Council a couple of years ago, where I acted for the successful appellant. Now, Marr was concerned with the clash between what's called a common intention constructive trust and a resulting trust. So if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, common intention constructive trusts. Well, what are they? Well, they're trusts arising by operation of law to give effect to the party's otherwise unenforceable common intentions when it would be unconscionable to allow one of them to resolve from such intentions. So typically when they've been relied upon by the other party, such as to produce that result. Now, common intention constructive trusts is, is now well established as a mechanism commonly used to resolve disputes about beneficial ownership of family assets in the context of which informal and often nebulously expressed and indeed often unexpressed intentions sometimes feature. There's been considerable uncertainty over the relationship between the common intention constructive trust and the resulting trust. Until recently, this was thought to have been settled by the two cases on the slide, Jones and Kernot, uh, and then approving and clarifying what was said by the House of Lords in Stack and Downing namely that the common intention constructive trust principles discussed in those cases apply only in cases concerning married or unmarried couples and others in domestic relationships who acquire a house or a flat for their joint domestic occupation rather than for business or investment purposes. In such domestic or home situations the position was that the starting point is that equity follows the law such that if the legal title to the property was in the sole name of one of the parties, that party would also be presumed to hold the entire beneficial interest. Whereas if they held the title jointly, they would be presumed to be jointly entitled to the beneficial interest, unless of course, there was an express declaration of trust to the contrary. That presumption could however, be rebutted by evidence that the parties had a common intention, relied on by say the claimant, that the beneficial interest should be held differently. If we move on to the next slide, please. The other approach outside such domestic home circumstances was based on Lascar and Lascar, which was a case in which Lord Newberger, who dissented in Stack, and we'll come on to the significance of that in a moment, held that the traditional approach of looking, in most cases, to financial contributions to the purchase price to determine beneficial interests, relying on the law of resulting trusts, survived in the case of family or like investments. Now Lascar and Lascar concerned a dispute as to the beneficial interest held by a mother and daughter in a former council home where the family had previously lived for many years and which they'd bought with a view to buy to let investment in their joint names 
uh, under the statutory right to buy scheme. Now, as set out on the slide, Lord Newberger said, in this case, the primary purpose of the purchase of the property was as an investment, not as a home. In other words, this was a purchase which, at least primarily, was not in the domestic consumer context, but in a commercial context. To my mind, it would not be right to apply the reasoning in Stack and Dowden to such a case as this, where the parties primarily purchased the property as an investment for rental income and capital appreciation, even where their relationship is a familial one. Consequently, Lord Newberger applied a resulting trust analysis, which meant that the parties' respective shares should reflect the size of their contributions to the purchase price. And Lord Justice is Rymer and Tucky agreed, including the payment of mortgages. Then an appeal raising issues of common intention, constructive trust and resulting trust came to the Privy Council from the Bahamas. And lo and behold, who should be on the board to hear the appeal? Lady Hale, who had delivered the lead judgment in Stack and Dowden, advocating in favour of the common intention constructive trust, and Lord Newberger, who had dissented in Stack and been in favour of a resulting trust analysis in Lascar. Just to add to the judicial tension, Lord Newberger had delivered a lecture in June 2017, after he became president of the Supreme Court, in which he said that his fellow judges in Stack had taken a wrong turn to get to the right answer, and that their rejection of the resulting trust doctrine seemed to him heretical. He also noted that one tends to feel particularly strongly about a case in which one dissents, and he quoted Lord Ackner, a former law lord, who reflected that proposition when he said that one only dissents where one's sense of outrage at the majority decision outweighs one's natural indolence. But as we see on the next slide, the case that brought this all to a head was Marr and Colley. Now the facts can be shortly summarised. In the course of an intimate and long-term personal relationship, Mr. Marr, a banker, and Mr. Colley, a building contractor, purchased a number of properties conveyed into their joint names. There was no express declarations of trust. All the properties, except for the couple's family home, were purchased for the purpose of investment. And this was a key issue in the case, because on it turned the question of whether, in relation to those investment properties, a presumption of resulting trust should apply, or whether the case should be treated as falling within the domestic consumer context, so that the presumption of resulting trust was inappropriate, or at any rate, might be trumped by other considerations. In each case, the cash element of the purchase price relating to the investment properties was found to have been paid by Mr. Marr, along with most, if not all, of the mortgage payments. Mr. Colley claimed that it was intended that he would renovate the properties or that he would build on the plots of land acquired. And so on that footing, or in any case, all of the properties were intended to be beneficially equally owned from the outset. Now, at first instance, the judge adopted the approach thought to have been confirmed by Jones and Kernot and Lascar. He dealt with the family home under Stack and Dowden, and as to the investment properties, he found that since all the properties had been bought for non-domestic purposes, resulting trust principles applied, and Mr. Marr was entitled to the entire beneficial interest in each. The trial judge's decision was reversed in relation to those properties uh, by the Bahamas Court of Appeal, which also applied Lascar, but found that the presumption of resulting trust was actually rebutted by some evidence of an email between Mr. Marr and his solicitor, indicating that he intended Mr. Colley to hold beneficially 50% of the investment properties. Mr. Marr appealed. In the Privy Council, Lord Kerr, delivering the opinion of the board, conducted a thorough review of the authorities and concluded that there should be no difference in the correct approach in domestic and non-domestic cases, save perhaps where there is no evidence from which the party's intentions can be identified. As it says on the slide, he said, the starting point in all situations is the intention of the parties. Lord Kerr noted that in Lascar, whilst the mother-daughter relationship was a familial one, the financial arrangement between them was not associated with a mutual commitment made to each other for the future. This meant that the investment in Lascar could be described as a purely financial, despite the familial element. Accordingly, Lord Kerr concluded that Lascar is not authority for a proposition that the stack approach, namely that beneficial ownership follows legal ownership unless the contrary is proven, only applies in the domestic context. In other words, it was not the intention of Lord Newberger in Lascar to draw a strict line of separation between acquiring a domestic consumer asset and acquiring an investment asset, regardless of the circumstances in which the acquisition took place. Lord Kerr concluded that context in this area of law is everything, and that generally the answer is not to be found by one presumption triumphing over another. 
This was a unanimous decision with which one assumes both Lady Hale and Lord Newberger agreed. Now, the practical effect of Marr and Colley is that in all familial and analogous cases, including disputes over investment properties and investment assets, practitioners and the courts will have to make a more thorough examination at the outset of evidence that might support or undermine claims of common intention and should not too readily resort to presumptions about the party's intentions. Now, confirmation of this new approach is provided by another recent Privy Council appeal from the British Virgin Islands, and we see that on the next slide, Ghani Holdings and Khan. Now, Ghani involved a gratuitous transfer of shares in three companies to persons who were, at that time, trustees of a trust established by the transferor. Lord Briggs, giving the opinion of the Judicial Committee, rejected a submission that on such facts there was a presumption that the transferred property was to be held on those trusts. And Lord Briggs explained that, insofar as the intentions of the parties were clear, these obviated the need to have recourse to presumptions. So what's the practice point to take away from the two recent Privy Council decisions? Well, I, I think it's this. Clear evidence of intention is rare. Many relevant factors need to consider whether intention changed at some point after acquisition makes it extremely difficult to predict the outcome of any particular dispute about beneficial ownership of family assets. Marr and Ghani emphasize the wisdom for those in personal relationships who invest in any asset, whether concerned for their own individual rather than mutual benefit, to seek independent legal advice and to make their intentions clear prior to making the investment. Ma is also a very good example of judicial differences of opinion being aired in the Supreme Court and then later being resolved by the same judges sitting in the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. I'm now going to hand over to Lucinda, who's going to oversee the question and answer session. Thank you very much to Tom and Lavinia for that very, very interesting run through. Um, questions wise, we do have a couple, which I will now put to the panel. We will put on display our learned Privy Council's team in their entirety. And uh, the first question I have is, um, is the Privy Council often called on to settle jurisdictional disputes? And if so, how does it approach such cases? Well, shall I step in and initially give an answer to that? Um, Please do. I mean, assuming there's no appeal as of right, and as uh, Lavinia told us, for a civil case to reach the Privy Council, it has to raise an arguable point of law of general public importance which needs to be considered by the committee at that time. The difficulty with, I think, jurisdictional disputes, i.e. what's an appropriate forum, what's the applicable law, they're often very fact heavy and rarely, certainly in my experience, get as far as the Privy Council. Having said that, uh, the recent BBI appeal that everyone will have read a few days ago when it was handed down in Livingston Properties and Eurochem, I think bucks that trend. As that case went to the PC uh, and judgment, as I said, was handed down, I think on the 30th, three days ago. Now, if my reading of that judgment's right, I think the reason it reached the Privy Council was that the question of how the BVI court should approach issues of forum non-convenience, for example, or whether Russia was in that case an available forum with competent jurisdiction, was deemed sufficiently important to warrant granting the appellant's leave to appeal. And I think I'm right in saying that after uh, hearing a full day's of argu argument, the Privy Council allowed the appeal and actually reinstated the first instant judge's uh, judgment, which I note from the judgment was given extempore, which I think must have been slightly perhaps embarrassing for the Court of Appeal, but it's certainly a pat on the back for the first instance judge. Thank you, Tom. That's fantastic. Does anyone else have a comment to add or shall I move on to the next question? Our next question is, what do you think is the future for the Privy Council? People are going to be sick, sick of hearing me speaking. Richard, yeah. I, I, do you want I, to I, chip in there, Richard? Well, okay. Well, hello, everyone. Um, the, the thing that strikes me about 
the um, cases I've done in the Privy Council is how much the justice, justices enjoy them. Uh, the very first appeal I did was one uh, from Trinidad, um, simply about an insurance claim for a, a, a warehouse or bookshop buyer. And that, this is now a case which is um, cited regularly uh, as an authority as to the circumstances in which an appeal court can overturn concurrent findings of fact, because that's what happened in this appeal. And I was amazed at how we had five justices of the Supreme Court who were just delving down into the details of this case, um, drilling down into documents probably more thoroughly than any uh, anyone had done before, lawyers or um, levels of judiciary. <laughs> and uh, the fact that they were you know, sitting, justices sitting in the highest court in the UK and um, the most eminent lawyers didn't alter the fact that they loved rub, uh, you know, rolling up their sleeves and getting uh, to grips with the facts of a particular case, which wasn't a particularly high value case. Uh, and uh, so I think that the reason I'm saying that is because I know that the um, justices really value the work that they do and um, want to encourage that. I think they, uh, not just for their personal enjoyment, but I think they think that um, they can um, do some good in um, bringing consistency to the law in all the jurisdictions for which they are the final court of appeal. And so uh, there's certainly no mood whatsoever to, um, you know, to, to discourage um, the, that, that ongoing facility that is provided uh, in London and so they will take practical steps to facilitate that. They've long um, encouraged parties um, to make use of the video facilities so that they don't need to incur the expense of coming to London. Um, our own uh, experience and our advice is that if one of the ad advocates is appearing by video and the other is there in person, the video advocate is at a disadvantage. Uh, but it's there as a, an option uh, for appellants and respondents if they want to participate but don't want the expense. And um, so there are various ways in which um, the board go out of their way to try and accommodate the needs uh, of the jurisdictions from which uh, appeals flow. And you know, obviously, as agents, we're delighted. Um, long may that continue. And um, hopefully, uh, there's no certainly there's no um, there's no sign uh, that um, the use of the Privy Council as the final court of appeal for a number of jurisdictions. There's no sign that that's going to to dry up. And there's no kind of trend of um, occasionally you know, some countries just make the decision that it's um, it's inconsistent with their independence to have. Um, decisions made in London, um, but we also have um, jurisdictions that, that join um, join in, and um, you know, Brunei is one of those examples where no historic connection, um, but uh, a choice has been made to to, to utilise uh, the board as a final court of appeal. I think, if if I may, just follow on from Richard. I, I think Richard's. Um, absolutely right. I think the the judges find Privy Council appeals fascinating, and um, I think Richard said roll up their sleeves. And I, I've certainly seen that in the appeals I've been instructed in. And I remember an appeal, uh, I think from Trinidad. It was a it was a murder case, and there was a there was an issue as to uh, a location and some of the photocopying. Then we didn't have electronic bundles. This was good old sort of fashioned paper copies of maps. wasn't up to uh, what it perhaps should have been. And the judges could see that someone in the um, sort of legal team on the um, row behind counsel was using a mobile phone and was looking quite sort of animated. And so they interrupted counsel and said, I think your sort of instructing solicitor's got something to tell you. And counsel sort of was passed this mobile phone that had uh, sort of Google Maps open on it to some remote um, sort of location in uh, Trinidad. And counsel said, explain what it, what it was. And the, uh, the board said, well, 
uh, pass pass the phone up, and we'll 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 look at the we'll look at Google Maps on someone's phone, and we'll look at it, and if it helps us uh, reach our decision, then then so be it. Which I have to say, when I was there, I took me back to sort of being in the county court, and perhaps when I started out doing a sort of small claims hearing, I don't think you'd have been allowed to pass up your own mobile phone to show a map um, of so a road traffic accident uh, to a deputy district judge, whereas there you had. Uh, a Supreme Court justice saying, no, 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 we'll, we'll have a look and we'll uh, make a finding based on it. So I think Richard is dead right. They, they find them fascinating and they want to do all they can to uh, reach the right decision. Mm. And I think it's a debate that's been around. I joined Chambers um, probably uh, too long ago, so 20 years ago, and there were people in Chambers then because we do a lot of Privy Council work debating the future of the Privy Council, whether it will be around in the next two years, five years. And I think Lord Phillips, when he was president, I'm pretty sure went on the record saying in an ideal world, former Commonwealth countries would stop using the Privy Council and set up their own final courts of appeal. Now that was 10 plus years ago. And I think Lord Newberger took a slightly more sanguine approach and said uh, the Privy Council could accommodate change without the need for revolution. And certainly that's my experience. I think the Privy Council will continue for the foreseeable future. And for my part, and I'm sure everyone on our panel, uh, we hope that we'll be debating the future of the Privy Council still in another 20 years or so. Mm. Can I just uh, add, because um, Tom's prompted me, that the, the, there, is a, there is a kind of a danger with the, the readiness of the justices to get to grips with the facts and uh, in fact in the, the Gurney Holdings case that uh, Tom was discussing um, Lord Briggs took it upon himself to make findings of fact in that case which none of the parties had asked him to make and on which he'd not received any submissions from any party um, but which through his own industry and research he decided were you know proper facts to find. Now whether or not uh, he was right to do so, um, we will never know because the parties were never given the opportunity to make submissions and to uh, you know, contest whether or not those findings were the right findings to make because once the board delivers its, uh, this was a, a judgment as opposed to advice to Her Majesty because it was from Trinidad, uh, no sorry it was BVI so forgive me, um, once, once the board has, has, has expressed its view then uh, that's it. Um, so uh, there, is, there is no further further line um, route of appeal, and uh, so the if if you get if you get in before the board, uh, you know, you've got a chance. If you're if you're an appellant, you've got a chance of overturning, um, our, and uh, and if you're a respondent, then uh, you know it's not over at all, uh, and there's a risk that um, of something unexpected happening. Because, um, because these justices will you know, are very confident in their own opinion. That's why they're at the top of the tree. Thank you. That's really good. Um, we don't have any more questions. So unless anybody would like to come forward with a question, I think it only remains for me to thank you all for coming. Um, Tom is just going to reveal, though, for the trivia part of the day, um, how long his uh, record breaking remote hearing went on for. If you were guessing while you were listening, he will now reveal the answer, which is Tom. The answer is six whole weeks. Wow. Yep. Gosh, good job your broadband was up to scratch the last day. <laughs> well done. Congratulations on that. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us this afternoon. I hope it's been a useful session. Um, we will be circulating to all attendees and even those who weren't able to make it uh, the slides for the talk. And as I say, uh, the recording will be available on YouTube. But thank you very much. Great to see you all and goodbye.